The spoon is cold in his hands as it rolls over the tablets on the kitchen counter. They're easily crushed, and every now and then he stops, scoops up the white powder and transfers it to a bottle. Soon the bottle will be full, but he's sure he won't need it all. With the mix he has created and his impeccable knowledge, the deed will soon be complete. This is True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to episode 141, The Murder of Annette Boer. Today's episode is brought to you by Dialabed, South Africa's largest branded bedding retailer. We all know that getting a great night's sleep makes us happier and healthier, so Dialabed is on a mission to make it as easy as possible for you. Shop at 76 stores nationwide or online at dialabed.co.za. A huge thank you to Dialabed for supporting True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming. And for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You, yes you, are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. Shout out to this week's Patreon and PayPal superstars. A huge thank you goes out to Sune Borsman, Shia Rodin, Penny Fora, Galen Johnson Jr. and Tebza for your support on Patreon. Thank you so much, everyone. Patreon supporters get one additional exclusive episode a month, a shout-out on the pod, and other exclusive content, including Q&As with me, as and when it's available. It's a minimum of $1 a month. I think you should do it. Please. And thank you. Keba. I mentioned a while back in an episode that I'm no longer easily shocked. I guess I've seen too much about what human beings can do to each other and how truly bizarre the world can be. But occasionally, very rarely, I do find a case that makes my mouth hang open for just a second. Usually it's related to the circumstances around the case and not necessarily the case itself. And that's true here, too. Let's just say, sometimes the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Really, the case itself here is just horrific and inhumane enough to warrant shock. And it does. But so does what happened after and around the cause circumstances. In researching this case, I used an episode of Heiskenoet Vare Lievensdramas, Fleers in Blut, an academic research paper based on this murder, and several media articles. So, let's get into episode 141, The Murder of Annette Boer. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. 
Unfortunately, in this episode, as is sometimes the case, there's very little information available about the victim and a plethora of information about the offender. So I'll work with what I have. Annette Boer was born in 1952. She qualified as a physiotherapist and was extremely well respected by her colleagues. Annette had always excelled at almost everything she put her hand to, and she was certainly never average. She was a member of Mensa, not the word people in Afrikaans, but rather the International High IQ Society. And it was there, in 1981, when she was 29 years old, that Annette met Colin Boa. Colin Boa was born in 1950, and although he was only two years older than Annette, by the time they met and soon married, Colin had already been married twice before. His first marriage with a woman named Mariette had lasted the longer of the two and produced two children. One of those was a son whose name was Colin Jr. His second marriage must have been extremely brief, and that wife's name has been kept anonymous in all sources I found. Colin Boer was a psychiatrist and had grown up in a Jewish family, although, by all accounts, he did not practice Judaism until it became useful for him, which will make more sense later. And that's really all we know to be absolutely true about Colin Boer's background, because the stories he would tell about this were proven to be absolutely untrue. I suppose that this is a good time to just put it out there, that Colin Boer spoke many, many untruths about many different things. Some of his stories about his childhood and early years that would be proven untrue started when he claimed that at the age of 16, he had joined the African National Congress, which at the time was an illegal organization in apartheid South Africa. He also claimed that as a 22-year-old medical student, he'd been illegally providing ANC freedom fighters with medical care when he'd been detained by the South African Secret Service and tortured for days on end, including having one of his testicles cut off and receiving electrical shocks to his genitals. This, he said, was done to force him to provide information to the apartheid security forces, which he refused to do. Although, of course, many of these types of incidents would not have been recorded anywhere in apartheid South Africa, people later attempting to find any veracity in Boer's claims say they could find no testimony from anyone he knew that confirmed that this may have happened to him. And probably most notably, there was no proof he was missing a testicle either. Although, I don't know for sure that anyone checked. Colin Boer practiced at Tigerberg Hospital for much of his career in South Africa, and although he was very good at presenting himself as a consummate professional, there were several occasions over the years when his conduct was questioned. Both Boer's wives before Annette would confirm that he had cheated on them both and that he was a significant womanizer. They had also been aware that some of his extramarital affairs had been with patients. For any medical professional, this is incredibly unethical. But for a psychiatrist, I almost feel it's more so. A person in this position has access to your innermost, most personal thoughts and emotions. They are the guardians of your mental health. And this is really completely vile for anyone to misuse that power dynamic by getting romantically involved with those they're treating. In addition, it would also emerge that many of those relationships were based around a stack of lies Boa used to manipulate his vulnerable patients. He would tell women that his wife had been raped 
and she was unable to have a sexual relationship with him anymore. He would use this to garner sympathy, as he claimed to be unwilling to leave his wife because it was not her fault, but his needs were not being met. To be clear, none of Boa's wives were ever raped. One of his colleagues would later say that Boa had a knack for finding people's weaknesses and honing in on those spots by using manipulative tactics to get what he wanted. Although these allegations of sexual impropriety with patients alone should have been reason enough for Boa to be removed from active practice, it would be something else that would eventually get him into trouble. In the same year that Colin married Annette, he was also revealed to be a pethidine addict. Pethidine is an opioid pain relief medicine that was once widely used for pain caused by a range of different conditions. Pethidine is now less often used because newer, safer opioids are available. As Colin was a psychiatrist, he was able to write falsified prescriptions, and this is how he was getting his hands on large amounts of pethidine which he was injecting and had become addicted to. His ex-wives would also confirm that they had seen him injecting pethidine while they were married to him. The Medical Council of South Africa brought charges against Colin, and he appeared before a tribunal where he was found guilty and declared an impaired doctor. As a result, Colin had to practice under supervision for the next 10 years, but he was still allowed to practice. Annette and Colin had two children together. Colin's son from his previous marriage, Colin Jr., said that his father hadn't really had much of a relationship with him. He felt that even when he did spend time with his dad, it was very much a shallow relationship, and as he grew up, he had to be the one to reach out to his father, or they would rarely speak. We don't know for sure whether Annette was aware of Colin's extramarital affairs, but she was a highly intelligent and observant woman, and I would be surprised if she didn't at least suspect something. Despite having to practice under supervision, Colin continued to work as a psychiatrist. He did seem to have no problem claiming to have qualifications that he didn't have, though. One of Colin's most common misrepresentations about his qualifications was when he regularly introduced himself as a pharmacologist. Colin did have a master's in pharmacy, but that certainly did not make him a pharmacologist. It did qualify him to work as a pharmacist, but being a pharmacologist implies that he was qualified to create and manufacture medicines, and he certainly was not qualified to do that. Although it's never been proven that Colin physically faked qualifications on paper, in 1997, he applied for and got a job in New Zealand that was really well beyond his qualification level. He and Annette had decided that they were going to immigrate, and in 1992, when his period as a supervised practitioner came to an end, they began looking for opportunities in other countries. As a qualified physiotherapist, Annette would have been a welcome addition to most countries too, but it would be Colin who secured an incredibly prestigious post as the head of psychiatry and medicine at one of New Zealand's biggest psychiatric hospitals. The Boers moved to New Zealand in 1997, and two weeks after he started his post at the hospital, Colin Boer was already having an affair with a psychiatric nurse there. At one point, in fact, Investigations would show that he was having affairs with four different women in the same hospital at once. All of the women believed they were the only ones in relationships with Colin. Eventually, Colin focused his attention on one particular colleague, who he seemed to find rather alluring. 
The woman was also a South African expat and also a psychiatrist, and she would become a major part of his life moving forward. When Colin moved to New Zealand, he was able to ramp up his lies about what he'd done in his home country and also played on the stigma that South Africa had of being heavily crime-ridden. He continued the claims that his wife had been raped and they were in a sexless marriage. But he escalated that lie by now claiming that Annette had been gang-raped by four men in South Africa, and this is why they'd left the country. That was absolutely not true. Colin also seemed to use the fact that people in New Zealand wouldn't have first knowledge of things happening in South Africa to his benefit. His made-up backstory grew to include him claiming that he'd been Nelson Mandela's personal physician and that he'd treated Mr. Mandela for PTSD when he'd returned from imprisonment on Robben Island. Firstly, no. No, he was not Nelson Mandela's personal physician. And secondly, it would be pretty damn unethical for him to be sharing patients' diagnoses without their consent, even if he had been. Unfortunately, many people believed Colin and most of the lies he spouted. Really, most people had no reason not to believe him. As a society, we are made to respect medical practitioners in general. They are assigned some level of automatic authority by virtue of them having completed medical school and having a title in front of their name. Most people tend to automatically see medical practitioners as trustworthy and ethical. And Colin Bower knew that and used it to his best advantage for all the wrong reasons. And really, Colin's lies had never been anything but helpful to him. The only time he'd been caught out for poor behavior professionally, when he'd been using pethidine, he'd received a pretty mild penalty in the greater scheme of things. And even in that situation, he did manage to convince quite a few people that the whole thing had been a setup by his ex-wives to discredit him because he'd married Annette. Colin's lies had actually been quite beneficial. So there's absolutely no reason why he wouldn't have continued to lie. And also why he wouldn't have felt assured that maybe, just maybe, he could get away with the greatest deception of all. In 1999, Colin went to a convention in Copenhagen with a colleague he was having an affair with. He'd only been home for a few days when his wife, Annette, began to experience some strange health issues. Annette had always been very healthy. The couple had had to undergo a full physical when they entered New Zealand just two years before, and they'd found absolutely no issues with her. So the sudden onset of dizziness, blurred vision, and being unstable on her feet was very scary for Annette. She saw a few doctors, but no one could figure out what was wrong with her. At one point, she thought perhaps it was an issue with her vision, so she'd had new glasses fitted, but it made absolutely no difference. Over the next few weeks, Annette's condition continued to worsen. The active and vibrant woman was practically permanently bedbound and still no one could identify a specific health issue that could be causing her problems. On the 20th of November 1999, Colin Boer said he awoke to find his wife unresponsive in the bed next to him. An ambulance was called and she was rushed to hospital. There, she would be treated by Dr. Andrew Bauer, a specialist in acute and emergency medicine. Paramedics had tested Annette's blood sugar on scene and found that hers was extremely low, and this is likely what had caused Annette to fall unconscious. By the time she'd arrived at the hospital, a drip had managed to bring her around and start to stabilize her. 
and Dr. Bauer was able to have a long conversation with Annette. She reported that she had absolutely no history of sugar-related issues, and that in the prior weeks, these spells of dizziness had come on quite suddenly, and then by the time she arrived at a doctor, everything was fine again. Dr. Bauer also spent some time chatting with Annette about some of her personal life, and the woman reported that she was a practicing Christian. I know, this sounds like a random thing to mention, but it will be important later. Annette was admitted, and her condition had been severe enough when she'd been found that she essentially had been very close to death, so Dr. Bauer wanted to figure out what was causing this before he allowed her to go home, because the problem could rear its head again at any moment, and they might not be so lucky next time. The morning after Annette was admitted that first time, Dr. Bauer met her husband Colin. He describes feeling immediately uneasy around the man. Colin introduced himself as a psychiatrist, a physician, and a pharmacologist. And the doctor quickly realized that for one person to be qualified in all of these things, he would have had to have been continuously studying for more than 20 years after his seven years of medical school. Clearly, not very likely at all. Dr. Bauer would also quickly figure out that Colin didn't have a pharmacologist's level of knowledge because when he presented him with Annette's blood test results, the man couldn't read and interpret them without assistance, something that Bauer says would have been a simple task for a trained pharmacologist. Considering that Annette did not have diabetes or any other sugar-related condition, and she was not presenting with any of the sudden-onset symptoms she'd had while she was in the hospital, the doctor felt that there must be some form of medication that could be causing her blood sugar level to bottom out so severely. He asked Colin to search the home and look for anything that could be causing it. Colin reported back that there was nothing there. Annette had no further incidents while in hospital, and after all their tests were exhausted, doctors agreed to let her go home on the 24th of November. She'd been home for less than 24 hours, when she once again began to feel ill. Colin had been given a device to measure Annette's blood sugar with, and he'd been told to call the ambulance if she fell below a certain threshold. But when Annette asked him to test her, the test showed her sugar was normal. She continued to feel worse and worse, though. Eventually, she was completely bedridden again confused and having difficulty communicating. When Annette had originally gone to hospital, Colin had assured her that the children were being taken care of by one of his colleagues, who was assisting at the home. This colleague was, of course, the woman Colin was having an affair with. By the time Annette's condition had worsened again, the woman had essentially moved in to the Boa home, according to reports. Annette would have seen this woman moving around her home and in her condition been unable to fathom why she was there. Then, on the 29th of November, Colin once again called an ambulance. Annette's blood sugar levels were again dangerously low and after being administered glucose, she suddenly felt better again. Doctors were baffled. Annette's blood tests also didn't pick up any forms of medication that could be causing the low sugar levels. So the team treating her decided that there must be some internal reason for the issue. Perhaps a tumor on her pancreas, which was not detectable on an ultrasound. So they decided to operate and take a biopsy. That too bore no results and no tumours or other abnormalities could be detected. Once again, Colin was instructed to keep a sharp eye on her sugar levels and test her regularly so that as soon as it started to dip, 
they could figure out what was causing it, because it only seemed to happen when she was at home. Colin insisted he had been testing Annette, and all the tests had been normal. Annette even said that once or twice Colin had actually shown her the test, and she'd seen the results with her own eyes. Doctors once again discharged Annette to return home so that she could enjoy Christmas at home with her family. And as had happened before, no sooner had she returned home than she immediately fell ill again. Annette's family back in South Africa were extremely concerned about her. Being so far away and just hearing second-hand news about her condition was terrifying for them and Colin was really not terribly helpful. Annette hardly ever had enough energy or wherewithal to speak on the phone, and Colin simply told them that there was no point in them coming to New Zealand because it would only upset Annette. It would later be revealed that Colin had told many different stories about what was wrong with Annette. He'd even told some people that she'd been diagnosed with brain cancer that was progressing so quickly that she'd already lost all her faculties. Of course, this was an ideal way to ensure that no one asked to speak with her or come to visit. Annette was losing her faculties quickly, but she hadn't been diagnosed with anything yet, and the only access she had to doctors was when she became ill enough for an ambulance to be called. Other than that, by all reports, she was finding it difficult to focus enough to even feed herself. Christmas came and went, and Annette only got worse. Colin continued to take sugar readings from her and said that they were all fine. Then, on the 4th of January, Annette appeared to have taken a significant dip. Colin spoke to a few people on the phone that day, saying that he wasn't sure that Annette had much time left. He told his brother-in-law that he couldn't take her to the hospital because, he claimed, medical services in New Zealand didn't operate in the first week of January because everyone was on leave. That night, he, his colleague who was now spending most of her time at his home, and his children went for a walk on the beach before bed. When they returned, Colin put the children to bed and popped his head in to see Annette. Her condition did not seem to have changed, he said, and he thought a good night's rest would do her well. So he decided to sleep in the guest room that night. On the morning of the 5th of January 2000, Dr. Andrew Bauer, who had treated Annette, received a telephone call from Colin. He told the doctor that Annette had died during the night and he needed him to come out to the house and sign a death certificate. Colin said he'd already asked the local GP to do it, but the doctor had allegedly refused to sign off the death certificate. Dr. Bauer went out to the home, although it wasn't something he would ordinarily do, because he felt a sense of unease about Annette's illness and now apparent demise. When he arrived at the Boa home, he confirmed that 47-year-old Annette Boa was indeed deceased. She had been dead for several hours by the time he attended, and immediately he felt that something was wrong. The bedclothes were very untidy, and the fitted sheet was pulled up. It looked as though Annette may have experienced a seizure in her last moments. She'd also soiled herself, which is also an indication of a possible seizure. Dr. Bauer was suspicious of Colin's behaviour. Although he acknowledged that everyone grieves differently and Colin may have just been in shock, he noticed that the man was completely emotionless and didn't seem to be grieving for his wife at all, despite having found her dead in her bed just a few hours before. Dr. Bauer also declined to sign off on the death certificate and instead alerted the local police, 
who arrived at the home soon after. In the days after Annette's death, Colin declined a post-mortem and insisted that his wife was Jewish, and she therefore needed to be laid to rest as soon as possible. Dr. Bauer knew this to be untrue. Colin may have come from a Jewish family, but according to Annette, he was certainly not a practicing Jew. He did, however, start wearing a traditional yarmulke, all of a sudden after Annette died. Dr. Bauer also knew and told police that in all of his conversations with Annette, she'd spoken about practicing the Christian faith, and had definitely not been a practicing Jew. Dr. Bauer asked the police to ensure that at a minimum they did a stomach wash of Annette and took some tissue samples before allowing her body to be released. It seems that at this point, authorities were unsure that they really wanted to come between the seemingly esteemed psychiatrist and his professed faith. So they did as Dr. Bauer asked, and then released Annette's body to Colin, who promptly cremated her remains. In the days that followed, Dr. Bauer was advised that certain medications were discovered in Annette's stomach. They were all the types of medications he had tested for while she was his patient, those that would affect her blood sugar. But they'd been in such low concentrations at that point that the lab at the hospital had not picked them up. But the more sensitive equipment at the forensic lab had. The medication found in Annette's stomach included Humalog, which would have caused Annette's body to overproduce insulin and significantly reduce her blood sugar. Also present were sedatives and antidepressants. None of these drugs had been prescribed to Annette, and there was no reason for her to have them in her stomach. When Colin was initially asked about the medications, he said he'd never heard of any of them. Strange for a man who claimed to be a pharmacologist, and even for a man who really was a psychiatrist. You'd never heard of antidepressants and sedatives? It was also proven that, given how much of the medication was already in Annette's bloodstream, she could not have been conscious enough to also take the medication that was found in her stomach, partially digested. That meant that someone had to have given it to her. And considering they weren't her medications, and they also had likely been making her incredibly ill for months, that spelled something criminal, indeed. With this, New Zealand police were able to get warrants to tap Colin Bower's phone and intercept his email communications. What they immediately discovered was that he was having an affair with his colleague, the same woman who'd been helping him to care for the children while Annette was ill. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. Colin Bower had left a paper trail to his own destruction. Emails going back several years were found on Colin's computer, in which he'd contacted various experts in diabetes forensic pathologists and other related experts to ask questions about how the body metabolizes certain medications meant to control sugar levels. One of the most chilling questions he asked was whether a forensic pathologist would check between the toes of a deceased person for an injection site. Emails between Colin and his girlfriend indicated that he was unhappy in his marriage, and the two discussed their possibilities of a future together on many occasions. Police were able to gain a search warrant for the Boa home and Colin's office. They were able to determine that between September 1999 and January 2000, Colin had made out 12 fraudulent prescriptions for various medications in patients' names, which he had personally collected. All of these medications were for drugs which regulate blood sugar, antidepressants, 
and sedatives. The exact combination of drugs found in Annette's stomach and bloodstream. Some of the later prescriptions were for a liquid form of the diabetes drug, which was injectable. Upon searching the Boa home, under the kitchen sink, police found a stack of pornographic magazines, and behind that, a jar containing a white powdery substance. That substance was tested and came back as the combination of drugs that was found in Annette's body. In addition to this, they found the sugar meter that Colin had allegedly been using to monitor Annette's blood sugar levels, and although there was still blood on the meter, and it clearly had been used, when that blood was tested, it was found to be canine blood likely from the Boa's pet dog. The evidence against Colin Boa was pretty damning. They brought him in for questioning, and he suddenly had a very different explanation for Annette's death. Annette, he claimed, had been suicidal for years. She'd been struggling with her mental health, although she hadn't let anyone outside of the home know it, and she'd eventually taken her own life by using medications she'd found in the house. The reason that these medications had been in the house, Colin claimed, was another big surprise, and that was that he'd been diagnosed with cancer, and he'd been fighting it for some time. He didn't want anyone to know, so he'd been prescribing medications for himself to help him. Police absolutely did not believe Colin, but they also wanted to collect additional evidence before they laid charges, because with the suspect having lived most of his life in a different country, the investigation was going to be extensive, so New Zealand police needed to do that first, before laying charges, so that they could immediately go to trial thereafter and not try and play catch-up. Through Interpol, New Zealand police requested the SAPS's assistance. There were several parts of Colin's history they wanted to verify, and essentially, they were building a case to prove that the man had lived within a vast web of lies most of his life. While I've already mentioned some of the lies that would be uncovered by police, there are others that are even more bizarre and shocking. New Zealand police had come to South Africa expecting to speak with one ex-Mrs. Colin Boa. Because, well, Colin had been telling everyone who would listen that his first wife, Mariette, had murdered their two children and then taken her own life. She, of course, had not done any such thing, and she and both children, who were adults by then, were very much alive. This had undoubtedly been used by Colin to garner further sympathy from well-meaning people, and maybe also to explain why he had little to no contact with his first two children. There may have been a third reason around this, but we'll get to that a little later, when this case gets even more bizarre. Police also confirmed that the only thing Colin Boa was qualified to do was practice as a psychiatrist. That was it. He was not a pharmacologist, or an internist, or a physician, or any of the other things he claimed to be. If there was a qualification for pathological lying, however, I'm certain he would have earned that one with honours. Police interviewed Annette's family while in South Africa as well. Her mom and sister were horrified to hear that there were suspicions of foul play in Annette's death. The story they'd been fed by Colin made it seem that Annette had several different health issues that had cropped up altogether, and she deteriorated over time and passed away of natural causes. They did have a very interesting story to tell about a visit Colin had made to South Africa shortly after Annette died, though. 
In the days after Annette's death, Colin had arrived at her mother's home unannounced. He said he'd come to finalise a few things in South Africa related to Annette's passing, and although his sudden presence was shocking, his appearance was more so. Colin had shaved his head, his beard, and even his eyebrows. He told Annette's mom that he'd contracted head lice, so he'd had to shave all his hair off. Also, while in South Africa, he attended a government's clinic and was able to secure one of the clinic's letterheads. When he told police that he had cancer, his proof had been a letter from this clinic. In visiting the clinic, police were able to ascertain that the letter had been faked. There was absolutely no proof that Colin Boer had cancer. Also in South Africa, police were able to discover that Annette had a life insurance policy in her name to the value of almost 1 million rand. In addition to their property in New Zealand, which was also valued at 1 million rand and would now be solely owned by Colin, this only added to the affair as significant motive for the quickly evolving theory that Colin Boer had murdered his wife. Both of Colin Boer's ex-wives also reported that he had been extremely violent with them throughout their marriages. We do not know if Annette experienced the same level of violence, but his first wife Mariette would say that when she was pregnant with their first son, Colin had pushed her down the stairs and when they had gone to hospital, he'd asked her to lie and say that she'd fallen so that he didn't lose his medical license. On the 15th of September 2000, nine months after Annette's death, her husband was arrested for her murder. In the trial that started shortly afterward, the prosecution presented what they believed had happened. Their version was that Colin Boer had been planning to kill his wife for years before her death. He had systematically collected information about the best ways to do this to avoid detection. There was a belief that Colin may have gone as far as purposefully moving to New Zealand, a country with a very low murder rate, to commit this crime. This part of the theory seemed supported by a lecture that Colin had given his students at a local university just a month after Annette had died. In the lecture, he discussed what he called the perfect murder, which involved injecting a victim between their toes with an overdose of a drug which would push their sugar levels down so significantly that they would lapse into a diabetic coma and eventually pass away. In that same lecture, he said that this perfect murder would best be committed in a country just like New Zealand, with a very low murder rate, because, according to him, police would not be geared up for a murder investigation. And the prosecution believed this is exactly what he'd carried out. They put forward that from September 1999, when Annette had first started to feel ill, Colin had been administering the drugs he hoped to use to kill her in a powder form to her food and drink. He'd essentially been testing the levels that would be required to kill her during this period, using his wife and the mother of his children as a human guinea pig. Then, when the powder form was not working fast enough, he'd moved on to the liquid drug Humalog, and the prosecution believed either injected this between her toes, or even possibly, or additionally, injected it into her tampons, so that her body would absorb the drug from the tampon when she was on her period. Unfortunately, neither of these theories could be proven concretely, as a full post-mortem had not been done on her body, but the prosecution believed she had undoubtedly been murdered by her husband. Colin's version and his defence 
was that Annette had had an underlying health condition and that she had suicided. The prosecution presented all of the evidence to show that Colin Boer was a liar of epic proportions. His inquiries about what would and wouldn't be picked up in a post-mortem, as well as his lecture to his students about the perfect murder, were also presented as evidence. Colin had already admitted to procuring the drugs, so the real question was, had he administered them to Annette without her knowledge, or had she, as he claimed, wanted to take her own life? Dr. Andrew Bauer testified that Annette had at no point in all the time he treated her presented with suicidal ideation. And although he acknowledges that this is not always externalized, he said that Annette was working with him and his team actively to try and figure out what was wrong with her. Had she wanted to die, surely she would have just discharged herself when she was well enough to do so. If she had knowingly ingested medication that had been causing her condition, it seems unfathomable that she would then subject herself to an operation in which a significant portion of her pancreas was removed to test for tumours. In addition to this, there was absolutely no evidence of, of the so-called underlying medical condition that Colin claimed she had. And on the occasion that had killed her, it had already been proven that it would have been physically impossible for her to take the last round of medication she had in her stomach herself. The trial lasted for six weeks, with the prosecution presenting several witnesses that testified to the changes that happened in Annette's body related to sugar levels and how it was impossible that these had happened without external intervention. On the 19th of November 2001, Colin Boer was found guilty of the murder of his wife. The sentence he was handed down was life, which in New Zealand at that time meant he would need to serve 17 years before being considered for parole. Along with the sentence, a deportation order was issued, which was to be carried out if and when Colin was granted parole. And with that, one of New Zealand and South Africa's strangest murder cases came to a close, and Colin Boer began serving his sentence. His license to practice medicine in any form was also revoked. The Boer's children, who I believe were probably teenagers at the time this happened, were well protected from the press, which I think is really only fair. I cannot imagine how much those children suffered during this entire episode, and I would think that they likely would have had to leave New Zealand to stay with family in South Africa, as I don't think they would have had anyone in the country to look after them. I did see some mentions that the children had perhaps not believed that their father was guilty, and I can fully understand their difficulty in accepting it. I can only imagine how hard it must be to have your father's whole terrible web of lies laid out on display, just after you've lost your mother quite suddenly. The trauma from that must be unspeakable, and I really do hope they've managed to heal and move forward. In 2015, after having served 14 years in prison, Colin Boer was considered for early parole, but was unsuccessful at that time. During that process, though, he seemed to realize that there was a deportation order out against him for the first time. The order would be actioned when he was granted parole. And even though he was declined for parole at that time, he started legal action in an attempt to have the deportation order set aside. Boa claimed he was a changed man. Those are his words. And perhaps the closest to an admission of his wrongdoing that anyone would ever get. At that time, he claimed that his wife's death had actually been an assisted suicide, but he hadn't said so when he was on trial, 
because of the stigma around assisted suicide. Um, I think there's a bigger stigma around murder than assisted suicide, even in the year 2000, but maybe that's just me. Collins' attempt to have the deportation order set aside was unsuccessful, and in 2017, when he was released on parole, he was immediately deported back to South Africa. Colin moved to KwaZulu-Natal, seemingly to live with family. And just a year after his release, he died from a chronic kidney condition he'd been living with for several years. He was 68 years old and had lived for 21 years more than the wife he'd murdered. And now, for the mouth hanging open bit. And to get there, we need to rewind all the way back to 1999. Seven months before Annette Boer was murdered by her husband in New Zealand, 11,500 kilometers away in Johannesburg, South Africa, another woman was murdered. That woman was named Ria Boer. She was the wife of Colin Boer Jr., Colin Sr.'s oldest son. In May 1999, Ria Boa was found strangled in her home. Initially, it was believed that she was the victim of a home invasion, which had resulted in her rape, torture, and eventual murder. But an investigation found that not to be true. Ria had been murdered by her husband, Colin Jr. And not just that, Colin Jr.'s mother, Mariette, the first wife of Colin Bower Sr., had been involved in the cover-up of the murder and found guilty of that too. That case is entirely bizarre in itself, with Ria's mother having been assaulted for looking into the murder, Ria's daughter having allegedly been kidnapped, and a whole range of other strange scenarios. And I'd definitely like to cover that case in full at some point. Essentially, it seems Colin Jr. eventually pleaded guilty to the crime of culpable homicide, claiming he had strangled Rhea in the heat of the moment because she wanted to divorce him and take their child away. He'd only admitted this after his mother had attempted to claim that it had been her that had killed Rhea. He was sentenced to just eight years in prison. And I will say that without having viewed the full details of this case, I tend to think that today, with an additional 23 years of knowledge and understanding about the nature of domestic violence and intimate partner murder, the court and prosecution would have handled this very differently. But the fact remains that seven months before the father murdered Annette, the son killed his own wife. In fact, both were actually arrested and on trial around very much the same time. It's just bizarre. Nature? Nurture? Something more sinister? Who knows? What I do know is that two women lost their lives. And with all the bizarreness, that is really what matters. I often wonder about the people who were left in Colin Boa Sr.'s wake. The women who were convinced that they were the only ones, when they were really only one of five or six. The colleagues who had trusted him with their patients, made referrals to him, vouched for him. And perhaps most importantly of this circle of tertiary victims, his patients. I'd like to think that maybe Colin was a decent psychiatrist, and maybe he really did help a lot of people with their mental health. 
that I just can't see that being true. The man couldn't string two sentences together without one of them being a lie. By his learned colleague's assessment, he was conniving and manipulative for his own benefit. How many people entered Colin Bower's office on the edge of their mental health, desperately hoping for assistance, for a hand to reach out and pull them back onto the boat, only to be pushed overboard into shark-infested waters? I think poisoning is one of the most chilling ways to kill someone because it hardly ever works the first time and the killer very often has opportunities to stop but as happened with Colin, he didn't. Instead, he continued to watch his wife and the mother of his children suffer incredibly over several months slowly increasing the dosage until he was able to kill her. And that, I think, takes an incredibly cold person. A terrifying person, even. He watched his children's tear-filled eyes as their mother faded away in front of them. And he carried on. Annette Boa was a highly intelligent woman, and although I think she knew very well that Colin was not the most honest man, I'm sure she never believed he would be capable of what he did to her. On that last night, he left her alone in their bed. The doctor said it was clear that Annette's death had not been peaceful. She had not simply slipped away in the night, none the wiser of her predicament. Although she had been unable to help herself, she had experienced seizures and very possibly pain before she eventually died. Were there moments of lucidity when she tried to call out for help? Did she wonder where her husband was? Or did she see him as he entered the room that night, filled syringe in hand, and recognize in that moment, after years of deceit and betrayal, that she'd never really known the man looming over her? He was and had always been a complete stranger. Annette Boa. Rest gently. If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.